Ugh, highway systems was the bane of my existence as a recent grad, holding down three part-time teaching positions in and around Toronto. No exaggeration, there were days where I would spend up to three hours on the 401, commuting from one site to another. I guess with all of this time and traffic, thinking about the courses I was teaching, I started making comparisons between my daily commute and the neural traffic we see in the spinal cord. We open this lesson with an elaboration of this comparison. Lucky for us that the spinal cord is much more efficient than the Toronto highway system. Good day, and welcome to this installment of the Gross Anatomy video podcast series. Today, we'll be taking a closer look at both the macroscopic and microscopic anatomy structures associated with the spinal cord. No kinesthetic learning exercise is associated with today's lesson, but we are going to start with a five-minute conceptualization exercise comparing the spinal cord to a highway system. The purpose is to introduce you to a concept that I will relate back to time and time again through the duration of this course. The spinal cord represents a system of axonal channels projecting between the brain and the peripheral effector organs. When I first started studying the spinal cord, I couldn't help but think of a highway system, an analogy that has stuck with me to this day, and helps me make sense of the neural circuits we encounter. It's just the way my brain thinks. I've used this analogy a lot in my teaching career, and most students find it helpful for their own understanding. So let's get to it. Imagine that you are working for a courier company at a train yard location off of Broadway here. A parcel comes in off a train that needs delivery to a business located off of Cleveland Drive. You collect the package and take the route shown on the Google map here. Looks like we jump on Harlem Road to Walden, take the northbound I-90 all the way up to Cleveland Avenue, then take the exit to deliver the package. Well, it turns out that the customer receiving the package has his own that needs to get down to the Walden Galleria Mall. So you take the documents and head back down the I-90 southbound, get off at Walden Avenue, but this time you keep right to stay on Galleria Drive and follow it to the mall. Pretty straightforward, right? Well, to a certain degree, so is the nervous system. Conceptually, anyway. It can be thought of as a major highway system similar to the I-90. It contains a series of neural tracks, some of which carry sensory information up to the brain, and others of which carry motor information down to the effector organs, smooth and skeletal muscle, to initiate muscle contraction. Similarly, the I-90 has both north and southbound lanes which carry traffic both to and from Cleveland Avenue, in this example here. Also note that the I-90, and all highway systems for that matter, are organized such that each lane is dedicated to either a north or southbound lane. All northbound lanes are grouped together on the east side of the median divider, while all southbound lanes are to the west. The arrangement makes obvious sense. Alternating north and southbound lanes would have disastrous consequences for making lane changes. You'll notice a similar sort of arrangement in the spinal cord. Now, don't freak out thinking that you have to memorize all these track names for the 407 course. That'll come in a later neural course. Just pay attention to the colors. The cord is riddled with various tracks containing neural projections with similar destinations. These neural tracks can be broadly classified as either sensory or motor, depending on whether they are heading towards or away from the brain. As with the highway system, we see a general organization of sensory tracks, shown in blue, located in the posterior portion of the spinal cord, and motor tracks, shown in red, located more anteriorly and towards the middle of the spinal cord. This organization improves the efficiency of neural conduction similar to how organization of a highway system improves the flow of traffic. The analogy can be extended to the peripheral nervous system. Spinal nerves project off the spinal cord at regular intervals through dorsal and ventral roots, just as major east and west brown city streets connect the I-90 at fairly regular intervals through on and off ramps, respectively. These spinal nerves serve a similar function to the major city streets, allowing a large volume of traffic to exit the spinal cord very close to its terminal destination. From there, the nerve continuously divides into smaller and smaller branches, and so the terminal branches receive sensory information from or deliver motor information to a microscopic region of tissue. Similarly, each major road contains numerous side streets that continue to branch. The result is that every driveway to every house in America is directly connected back to a highway through a series of street branches. 
In the present analogy, the Walden Avenue exit is the closest for both the train yard and the Walden Galleria Mall, so it makes sense to use exit 52 here to make it to both locations. Of course, you could take alternate paths, just like Google Maps showed earlier in gray, but these tend to be less direct, more time consuming. In short, just plain and practical. For other destinations on the route, of course, it makes more sense to use a different exit that is closer to these particular locations. The same goes for the human body. Sensory neurons detecting tactile information from a specific region of skin, for example, will all collect together and enter the spinal cord through the closest spinal nerve. And this creates a predictable and reproducible course of spinal nerve sensory distribution called a dermatome map. We'll discuss dermatomes in greater detail in later lessons. Also note that on and off ramps involve a one-way flow of traffic. I mean, you'd never want to risk merging onto a highway using an exit ramp, right? Same goes for the ventral and dorsal roots connecting the spinal nerves to the spinal cord. Ventral roots carry only motor information and dorsal roots carry only sensory information. At each spinal level, these roots merge to form a spinal nerve containing both sensory and motor tracks. Same as how the major city streets running off the I-90 have both east and westbound lanes of traffic. But when you look at the on and off ramps, it's only one way flow of traffic. So there you have it. Not too painful, right? My hope is that you'll be able to keep this concept in mind during our discussions of the spinal cord, particularly if you're not overly familiar with the spinal cord anatomy at this point in your academic career. I hope that you find that applying simple concepts of a road to a complex system of the nervous system, the material becomes better focused for you. Time for you to take a break and let the conceptualization exercise have an opportunity to sink in. We'll pick up with the cellular components of the nervous system and the gross anatomical structure of the spinal cord itself. See you after the break.